broadcasting live from being turtly enough for the Turtle Club. This is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Garrett Strother, and I'm your other host, Seamus Kelly. Now I'm going into Kermit. I'm going too f- I'm going into Frog instead of Turtle, unfortunately. Kermit's mouth is also very pointy, like Dana Carvey in The Master of Disguise, so I can't I can't necessarily say that that's wrong. That's why it makes sense that that voice is coming out of Kermit's mouth, is because his mouth <laughs> so, is pointy. So we're in agreement that we can publish our uh, paper then to the to the <laughs> medical boards. Uh, they don't call me Doctor Movies for nothing. <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. Well, for today's main segment, if that wasn't crystal clear, we are covering the brand new Netflix film Hitman starring Glenn Powell as our first foray into truly our first foray into Glenn Powell summer, I would say. And I'm very excited to get into it. Very excited. But we have a a healthy dose of news this week. Oh, Star- more than usual, I feel like, yeah. Yeah, starting off the bat with the announcement of a new Hunger Games book and movie following the Hunger Games in which Hamish Abernathy participated. Sunrise of the Reaping, the novel, will come out in 2025 with the movie from Lionsgate following shortly after in 2026. What do you feel about them calling their shot like that? They're pre-announcing the book and the movie that is going to accompany it. That that seems weird to me. I don't I don't necessarily love that they're already like this is a hit. We're back in the Hunger Games. We're back in the YA stuff. Like we're we're trying it again. I guess I I don't know. If you want the cynic in me, it's two separate markets. It's two separate content feeds, right? Like, but that's why I'm. Uh, that's why I'm like, that makes no sense. That means that they're gonna try to. It's like a single entity when it shouldn't be. There, there were decidedly two separate things. I feel like, and now we're we're they're, they're getting they're getting a little too uh, cocky, calling their shots here a little bit. I feel like they announced Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes pretty much in tandem with that book coming out. Maybe not when it was announced but i don't know to me it seems like the ballad of songbirds and snakes did very well at the box office it was a moderate hit especially for its budget i would say and so it's a no-brainer like okay if there's going to be more hunger games to adapt why don't we just go ahead and green light that now and get the hype train rolling that will also probably in turn increase book sales because people are going to want to read it and they know they're going to have a limited amount of time before the movie comes out. I, 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 we, I liked the the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and, and I, I thought it was an interesting idea to do that, but now they're, they're bridging this gap even further and I feel like they're just going to inevitably overstep their bounds with where this is oh, going. I'm you know, I, I, when we get the Effie Trinket Netflix oh show, God, yeah, I'm going to be pretty done with that. But. Exactly. You know, I, I want this to be good. I enjoyed the last one more than I ever thought I could after my experience with the original series that they did, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna be as reserved. If uh, well, hey, if there's another pit of snakes, we'll we'll talk again, maybe. <laughs> but you know that was like a huge decider for me. So I we'll do. see if the snakes I, I make remember. a return. Uh, otherwise, I just I feel like this is gonna be weird. Who are they gonna cast? I know this is like forty it's time years for a after. podcasting call. Oh baby. my god! Here it okay. goes. <laughs> okay, sh- I guess who were you gonna were you gonna ask about Hamish or were you gonna ask about Snow? I mean, ev- everybody. It's fo- it's forty years after the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, and twenty years after the original. I think is what I read, something like that. Twenty years before the original, because or, yeah, yes, re- yeah, Hamish yeah, yeah. is a boy. Um, it's just, it's. I don't know. I I haven't even. I've been so bewildered by this. I don't even really have anybody that would fit that area. I mean, the Snow one is a little bit more easy because you don't have to worry. You can just kind of cast. A middle-aged guy, you can <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland <laughs> yeah. could be. <clears throat> oh yeah, honestly, that I I think that would be interesting. I don't. I mean, I don't know if I know enough kid actors to you know. Is Archie from Riverdale gonna be? I mean, he's like <laughs> a thirty-year-old man. Isn't that Cole and or Dylan Sprouse? No, he's Jughead. 
Uh, oh, excuse. Why couldn't one of those two guys be <laughs> Hamish? You know, why not? Thirty-year-old Hamish Abernathy. I mean, a real Rachel Zegler was age appropriate. I I do think that they're sure, pretty yeah. good about Jennifer Lawrence and Josh Hutcherson were probably a little old to be their characters. I think they were probably both in their twenties in those movies. But I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Um, I await casting. I think this. It's honestly a little bit surprising that this is the thing that is coming out now, because I think the thing that more people wanted was the Hamish games. I don't think people were clamoring for, give me the President Snow origin story, but that turned out to be pretty good, and... If they were the other way around, I think that we would be going like, yeah, that Hamish movie, pretty good, but now they're jumping the shark. <laughs> Who cares about President Snow? Sure. I, I, you know what? You, that is that is fair. I reserve I reserve myself until I can see a trailer. Again, I was so all over the map with the, the Ballad of Songbird, Songbirds and Snakes trailer that I, I ultimately had a really pre- a pretty good time in, in that movie. So I am... I am reservedly excited if I if I can be. Well, I'm excited to see if your excitement <laughs> remains steady or if this is going to be a, a, a fizzle out situation for you. Pile of snakes. Let's see it. That's that's all I need. <laughs> Broadcasting live from a great big pile of snakes. This is oh, pop dude. culture reference. And returning to reprise his role, great big pile of snakes. <laughs> that in memoriam at the Oscars. <laughs> oh. Rough. God, so many snakes were harmed in the making of that great big pile of snakes. <laughs> um, Wallace and Gromit news? You, th- you think Wallace and Gromit news nonchalantly. Yeah. My, my goodness gracious, I am very excited. I watched that little teaser of, of Vengeance Most Foul is mm-hmm. what it is. Vengeance my Most God. Foul coming to de- Netflix this <laughs> December. One of the most... Uh, intimidating villains of my young life that penguins feathers mcgraw you absolute bastard i i'm excited to see the return i think we'll talk a little bit more extensively about wallace and gromit during our pop culture reference segment but suffice to say i do think one of the most perfect pieces of media ever created is the wrong trousers so oh my god yes they've got Big pants to fill, Seamus. Let me say that right now. <laughs> oh, I gotta bring a uh, bring a lot of Winsleydale to set for that one. I think that's it's gonna be it's gonna be a hit or a miss, and I'm really hoping it's a hit because I'm I'm hyped. I don't know. Maybe that's my own mistake. Hype is a is a drug that has led me astray before, but I think I, I it's hard to not be excited about something like this. Wallace and Gromit have never let me down. Ardman does on occasion let me down. Um, but Wallace but and Gromit, Wallace I mean, Gromit our boys. Never, literally Truly. never. And when they hit, they hit hard. Oh, man, truly. I, I It's been a while since I've, I've revisited the more modern stuff. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't stop me from putting on the classics. You know, those are just like all timers, but I am, I'm excited. I, I would, I, I want to know how dangerous it's going to be for the, for the boys out there. I'm, I have high hopes, I would say. Me as well. Speaking of high hopes that we hope do not get dashed, there is more wake up dead man casting, uh, which is actually at time of recording already started shooting. So, I think Ooh. this is maybe going to be the end of it for us, and all of our podcasting calls were total whiffs. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't put money on this, like I said we were <laughs> definitely going to. Uh, joining Kaylee Spaney, Andrew Scott, and Josh O'Connor in the third Knives Out mystery will be Josh Brolin, Thomas Hayden Church, Mila Kunis, Daryl McCormick, Kerry Washington, Glenn Close, and... Presumably playing himself after his hot sauce cameo in Glass Onion, <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Renner. I am so excited for the Jeremy Renner cameo. I mean, I I think that has ho- I, presumably been planned for a long time, but I, I think that's phenomenal for sure. Uh, love to see Josh Brolin. Thomas Hayden Church, I'm I'm kind of hyped oh, for. I, I, I was scared really trying to figure out who is going to be the adversarial detective to 
Benoit Blanc. I, I don't know why I'm so locked into that idea. I just feel like we haven't really had one. And Thomas Hayden Church may ring that bell for our boy out there. I, I'm, I'm excited. I would like that a lot. Regardless, I think this is a stellar cast. Significantly mm-hmm. less British than I would have thought based on the first three announcements <laughs> that they had. Yes, yeah, that's kind of my, where my mind was going to, but... Who knows who will play in in what accent, you know? I mean, we've got a British man playing a Southerner. Maybe we could be really going off the walls here. That would be pretty funny, actually. I, that we have Thomas Hidden Church doing a, a, a cartoonish Cockney <laughs> accent. <laughs> oh, my God. No, he's, doing like a, he's doing like a really obnoxious Sherlock Holmes thing, but he still doesn't match up to Benoit Blanc. I think that would be very funny. And for our last bit of news, we have a Warner warning. <laughs> just clean my, like, the ringing out of my ears. I'm putting a rag, and it's coming out of both sides of my head, going back and perfect. forth. Perfect. Oh, oh, perfect. Max has announced that they will be raising the prices of their ad-free options by a dollar a month and 10 to $20 a month a year for its annual rate. So nothing that's breaking the bank, but we're still seeing a general uptick in streaming service costs that is outpacing inflation, especially when you're looking at an ad-free option, which is supposed to be the streaming services saying, hey, we're still affordable, now you just have to subsidize it with ads. Uh, That option is slowly becoming less and less practical, I think, and... Again, trying to steer the consumer into, well, it's just a few bucks extra to pay without ads. Oh, my goodness gracious. I I saw this, and I, I, at this point, my mind keeps going to, we are maybe a year out from services like Netflix and Max and Paramount having an individual title rental fee if you don't want to pay for a full month of their service. I feel like we are down right back to the blockbuster conundrum here where somebody is going to say, well, you could rent a single Netflix original title for five bucks, or you can get a month on the ad tier for 10 bucks. And doesn't that sound like a better deal? And we're just going to keep adding a dollar on and chopping up each little service with ads and individual titles until we are just in the Stone Ages again. This is... Any, anytime we have more than a single piece of news, it's basically services are laying people off or raising prices. It, it, it's it's every single time, pretty much. As somebody who had to get Netflix for a month to do this week's episode <laughs> of the podcast... Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I was hoping you would have some free trial locked away in your pocket somewhere. No, but... unfortunately. Well, it's technically, it's it's yours too, bucko. It's the pop culture reference oh, account. Oh, hey, look at that. Uh, oh, well, if I'm not part of the household, Garrett, I think I might have a little extra fee associated with that, but... That's for the Battle of the Streaming Services 3, I think. Yeah, which uh, I think once the dust settles, you and I just said this a couple weeks ago on all of these <laughs> bundles... We are going to have to do the reappraisal oh sooner than I think we thought we were. <laughs> well, when you say the dust settles, it's like we're not going to get one of these updates every other month for one of the million services. So we might we might need to pick a date to really put a hard a hard line on it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, coming soon, uh, Battle of the Streaming Services 3, the re-rematch. Oh my God! It's uh, I'm ready to I'm ready to burn them all at this point almost. <laughs> uh, but with that, what do you say we get into the Netflix original, our main segment, Hitman? Let's do it. For today's main segment, we're going to be talking about the new Richard Linklater Netflix comedy, Hitman. Two words. Don't get it twisted. Not to be confused with Agent <laughs> Forty Seven. Uh, which I did initially when I was doing a little research about it, but I it is the ads are everywhere, so it's gonna be hard to miss. The ads are everywhere, and yet I mean maybe it's because I was good boy and I didn't uh, watch the trailers, not the movie I was expecting it to be. 
Oh, was it not, Garrett? Because I agree with that statement, actually, quite a bit. And maybe it is the similarly named Fall Guy that we just so recently covered and thoroughly enjoyed that had me expecting more of an action angle to a film like this, especially starring super sexy action star Glenn Powell. Is he an action star? I guess he's in Top Gun Maverick, and he's going to be in Twister's. I am, uh, yeah. Is is Twisters an action movie or a thriller? Because it's not it's like it's not like an enemy. I, but yeah, but the, well, he's yeah, doing but... action. I just read an interview with him this week where he said it's the most physical thing he's ever had to do for a movie. So including flying in a in a fighter jet. That's is what, what he I, said. I, wow, wow. Well, so let's get into Twisters. Like, well, let's <laughs> let's do it. I guess. Um. So. Uh, with that in mind, Seamus, did you enjoy the movie that Hitman turned out to be? I enjoyed. I enjoyed parts of it. I feel like going into this movie, I wanted some of the angles that they were setting up to be a little more pointed than what we ultimately got. Because it's a it's a pretty standard story where every time I think they're doing something specific to set up what he's conflict in his profession as a as an undercover person you know would would arise in in a situation like that he's he's got all these really specific pieces of his own life that end up just kind of being fine and and it kind of wraps up in a way where i never really felt like conflict rose past like the come up i i i think they had a lot of avenues to take and they didn't take any of them and then suddenly this movie was over where I wanted to see more of any of the individual interesting points that they were making with this movie. And I know there's some muddy waters with making a movie based on a real person who did real things like that, but... The, well, the movie the, already plays it pretty fast and loose with what it what? is adapting from real life, so exactly. I think that that's a fair enough criticism... Uh, I do, however, mostly disagree with you. I am I am here to defend I you Richard Linklater and Hitman. <laughs> um, I I had a feeling you were gonna maybe enjoy this one a little more than me for some reason. And I maybe it's my own s- stigma against a Netflix original, but we've been talking about Knives Out and Glass Onion stuff for a little while now, and I remember that being very satisfying. I just don't know if this one got there for me. I think that it is a victim of its own marketing, this film, that mm. I went into this expecting a action comedy where he was an actual hitman, I guess, like, that was yeah, kind of too. my angle. <laughs> um, I do not begrudge this movie not being that, but I also think that I was a little bit tempered because... I thought that that would have been a weird movie for Richard Linklater to make. Because <laughs> Richard Linklater, I love him. I think he's a, I think he's a good director. I really like a lot of his films. But it doesn't seem like action hitman movies, the kind of movie that he would choose to make for Netflix. Especially a movie where he was like so particular about the way that it's made that he went he went with a streaming service instead of a, a major studio that didn't want to do it the way that he wanted to which kind of implies a non-traditional sensibility to its tone and narrative i don't know how Seamus, on a show where we talk constantly about our frustration with contemporary leads not having sexual chemistry or any chemistry at all for that matter the way that this movie's leads glenn powell and adria arjona whose name i learned for this episode because we can't just call her for me we can't just call her bix from andor anymore i don't think she's in enough stuff adria arjona adria arjona 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 gotcha but you know gotcha yeah of course they have some of the most palpable on-screen chemistry I have seen in years. And you brought up The Fall Guy, which I felt like had some pretty good chemistry, but that was good chemistry for a movie of that size and ilk. This is good chemistry for anything, I think. I mean, it is crazy. 
and that's one of the parts uh, when I said there are some parts that I genuinely very much enjoyed. That is undeniable. They were phenomenal on screen together, and I wanted more of them together. I wanted something more messy than what we ended up getting between them because as it stands, I'm like, you know, it's it seems like a a, a, a straight line with, with very little deviations to what the larger conflicts they are throwing at them seem to set up. I, I think they are, chemistry-wise, incredible, and I... I mean, I know where Glenn Powell Summer, he's in everything these days, but I think that seeing them together again would make me very happy in a movie that I liked more. I, 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 it's, ah, I, I want to like it more because of them specifically, but I just can't seem to get myself there. Okay, addressing one of your criticisms directly, I felt like the, I mean, not that this movie's short, it's right at two hours, I think, mm-hmm. but... There was a streamlinedness to the narrative that I appreciated, that it did not meander, that it was funny and well-structured without taking too long to go on these little tangents. I think, like, every time he was in, and this is, like, Mm. what the movie is marketed around, so I don't feel like this is a spoiler, every time he's (laughs) in one of his different disguises... It lasted for exactly as long as I felt like was funny, pretty much. And then if we had lasted longer in those, it could have become... We um, we were invoking Master of Disguise in our <laughs> intro here. And I think if anyone really is unclear easily... about that fact, yeah. If anyone doesn't know cinema as an art form, Master of Disguise, thank you. It could have really easily devolved into that and become trite and annoying. And I don't think, for me, it ever did. And it left me wanting more of those elements, which is a good thing. I think that a movie not exhausting every one of its avenues is uh, a point of the art form, right? Of Mm -hmm. Even, well, that's a spoiler conversation. There are things that happen in the back half of this movie that I think are a little frustrating when you're watching it that happen off screen that upon reflection, make it that much more interesting and exciting that you are more concretely in one character's perspective. You're always with Gary or Ron, as he is known, undercover. Mm. And that there is no seepage of external elements to distract not only the audience, but the filmmaker. I... Because, like, I agree, actually. I, I my, my problem isn't with the l- lack of, of, of car- variation in the, in the people that he's playing. It's almost more in that the actual man, Gary, and the, the, the people he are playing aren't being zeroed in on enough individually. I, f- I feel like Ron as an entity and Gary as an entity, they're... Ah, I'm really getting close to. I'm really getting close to spoiler things. Do you want to maybe get into spoiler things? We so... have to. We have to do a more of a baseline. A little I bit know. First. I know. Um, I, okay. All right. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You'll back that up. I will bring you back to where we were once. We thank get you. Spoilers. Thank you. This has a strong supporting cast. I enjoyed a lot of the auxiliary characters, but again, I'm glad they didn't overstay their welcome. Retta mostly known yeah. from Parks and Recreation, is here. And I thought she was funny, and she had a very instantly well-developed character that I'm glad we did not have to sit in more boardrooms with than we already... Like, she's there when she needs to be, and she's not when she yeah. doesn't. Um, she's in the truck, she's got some fun radio stuff, a mm-hmm. few good things in the office, but ultimately, you're right, it, it doesn't get more than it needs to. She she is often a treat when she shows up in things that aren't Parks and Rec, and I, th- I think this was uh, a perfect use of her as an actor and, and this character that she's playing. Totally, and I think the same goes for the other, like, little, the, the shrimpy guy. Yeah, the other, I don't the, know. the mustache guy who's who wants to hang out with Ron. I Yeah, I, I thought he was a, a lovely, a lovely gentleman as well in this. So you have, like, fun little, like, Greek chorus, almost, characters scattered around the film 
Um, he has his students at his teaching job, which I do think they could have developed a little bit more of something there. I, that's mm. one of the elements that I wish we had spent a little bit more time in, although there aren't many. And I don't mean to say that beyond like maybe an extra like lengthening a scene. I don't think that anything major needed to go down there. I don't think we needed one specific student to be more developed, but just, I wish we had seen him in his teaching element a little bit more, mm. which we will follow back up in the continuation of our conversation. Spoilers. The film grain in this movie, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's grainy. It is a grainy stock, whatever. I should have looked up what Link later shot this mm. on, or if it's a, digital grain that they're putting over it i think that it and the netflix codec do not get along because it looks oh. bad when i and i thought that not bad but the grain is more overbearing streaming it on netflix than it is like i looked up a bunch of promo material on my laptop on my phone on youtube on my tv and you and i've complained ad nauseum about netflix's streaming codec on the show before so i feel like it's not particularly surprising that i did not feel like it complemented the like otherwise very good looking well lit film where i didn't i just thought the grain was was overbearing mm. i guess i didn't have that much of a issue with i guess i didn't maybe notice it as much as you i I'm trying to even remember if I noticed it much at all. I, I feel like it, it seemed fairly clean to me, but maybe I was more distracted about, like, my own waiting for actual events to go down before I, I sunk into the to the visuals of it all. I must they have been waiting for a long time. They shot it in 4K. I So whatever digital thing they put over it for the grain, I think, oh. doesn't look great. I might need to. I might go watch uh, a little bit of the beginning again at that point, just to to see a little more about what you're talking about. So I don't know. I don't. Maybe that was a unique experience that I was having. Like I said, the promotional material and other sources I could find don't seem to match what I was seeing when I was watching it on mm. my TV. So who knows? Um, that's just something I wanted to bring up. But with that, I think we're... Are you ready for spoilers? So, we, okay. Yes. I, would you I not would like recommend to. this movie? That, I'm, I'm struggling. What I'm, what I'm struggling with is that I'm comparing it against something like Argyle, which I Whoa. didn't love. And I'm not saying that it's like that is the exact same kind of reception that I had to it. I, I think I, I had almost a better reception to Hitman than I did to Argyle. I would hope so. Shamus. It's an incredibly different experience, an incredibly different movie, but but I, I think I did enjoy Hitman more than Argyle. It just seems like I had a similar reaction of recognizing avenues that a movie could clearly go down that I would enjoy and them avoiding them at all costs. Would it you... seems like there, it's, it seems like there were a few rewrites in between what we got and, and the initial idea that might have put a little bit more of an edge to the story that in, in something like adapting someone's real life, story and really putting a, a fictional twist on it i don't i don't think they went far enough i think is where i ultimately end on it okay i think that's i don't know if it's fair but it's i'll accept it and i will <laughs> and i will query I this <laughs> you do acknowledge that i just said it aloud i, I do, do appreciate it is, it is now canonically on the podcast <laughs> on air live to the folks at home how would you feel if i said that the lack of exploration and payoff in Argyle is incompetence, whereas in Hitman that is a, a choice of story focus. I I would at least accept that. <laughs> in a, uh, I, I would at least accept that notion in that whatever reasoning behind it, I did, in fact, enjoy Hitman more on my couch than I did going to the theater to see Argyle. Okay. I think whatever whatever is behind that, whatever the real difference is, it matters in that my enjoyment is significantly upticked with Hitman. 
Well, let's talk spoilers then. How about that? Let's let's, let's really dive please. into what your problems are here, starting with what we said we would immediately come back to, which is your frustration with the characterization of the character of Gary versus when he is Ron. Ah, is that how I even said that? I don't even you know. You didn't say it exactly to... that way. That's how I was it's... interpreting what you said. Why don't you correct me if I'm wrong, please? We have this we have these this moment towards the the early parts of the film where he is sitting down with his ex-wife in this interesting relationship that I can only imagine is pulled out of the real life relationship of the real life guy. I think I would assume so as well because it seems like too extraneous a detail exact, to not pick yes. back up later. I mean it tells you a lot about his character and in that way it is effective screenwriting. But yeah, oh yeah. and I, I was interested I, in the I agree idea with you. And, and and they have this conversation about like you can become who you know you can become different if you're just persistent at it and then we get this montage of of this man who's living a very docile life suddenly taking on this responsibility and all these different identity roles and it seems like they're setting up for Gary's conflict with these new adopted personality traits and how maybe in becoming Ron and in becoming the person that people like and want to hang out with and want to be in relationships with that he is having kind of an internal struggle with what that means for what he is, who he is. And to me, it seems like they instantly get away with literally everything. And I feel like there could have been a little bit more on the side of like, well, what is going to happen with, you know, these two people who are supposedly in love? Is she maybe taking advantage of his position as a supposed hitman? Will his relationships at his job change based on people running into him under alternate personas? But then it just, it all works out in a way that I feel like they didn't do literally anything except for murder two people. And they, it's just fine. I don't know. You know I, th- I, I feel like those elements are present. They're just not dwelled on as much. I can, I can agree that sometimes the Jeopardy feels short-lived. For example, the revelation that she did, in fact, kill her ex-husband mm. is very quickly, in in a matter of two scenes, resolved with the notes app conversation. Right, that not mm-hmm. only is she out of imminent danger for being fingered for that crime, but they are now back in each other's good graces. That there is like that that scene almost functions like the sex scenes earlier in the film to show these two people like becoming one in tandem and and feeding off of each other. And then you immediately turn around of you have the shoe drop where the dirty cop who is a really good performance played mm-hmm. by Austin Amelio, who is other in other link later films as well. Absolutely fantastic villain performance. I think the, the idea of showing up in the house, that's a really great reveal that again, does feel quickly resolved because the threat is eliminated within that scene. Mm-hmm. I can see those frustrations. I can understand that to me. I don't have that issue as much because I don't think that one, those elements are not super what the movie's interested in, but two, we know relatively how things are going to go. So why draw it out? I guess I think that's how Linklater seems to have written this movie is Mm -hmm. almost in, and it, this is going to sound like a negative thing, and I think to you it is a negative thing, but to me, I I was interested... I don't wish every movie were like this, but I like that it almost felt like he was writing it in shorthand. Here is the narrative. We're going to have our, our fun hijinks. We're going to have our, our fun disguises. We're going to have the Jeopardy and the reveals, but we're not going to do all of the rote... Imagine if there were more scenes of them broken up in at the end of the second act. 
how sure. <laughs> annoying okay. that would feel. And you're like, yeah, I know that they're... You might not know that the exact resolution to them getting back together is going to be the notes app conversation, which I think is maybe the best scene in the movie. I mean, I like that scene a lot. That's for sure. But to me, I don't think that it's him skipping steps because he doesn't know that he can take them or should take them. He's, he's abbreviating things to keep the film feeling snappy and not boring. That's how Hitman reads to me. Again, I don't think it's like his best movie. I don't even necessarily know if I like it as much as I like The Fall Guy, which I don't think is a very fair comparison to this, even though we've been doing it all episode. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, again, that is us going in with very minimal idea of what is happening. It's just a similarity in name and, and you know, attractive action star lead maybe i didn't think it was going to be that big in scale or anything like that but i did think you know action comedy i will say this this is a little bit of a tangent i want to get back to your thing but Mm. people are calling this a screwball comedy i think this is way less of a screwball comedy the fall guy oh 100 percent. i i don't even necessarily think i would classify this as a screwball Uh, comedy i feel like there's there needs to be more how do you define a screwball comedy? I guess that's a huge question. There's that's like a, a bunch of a little short... things because it had like on the surface it does seem like it could be a screwball comedy. You have a you have a handsome lead who's who's a nerd. Like that is an element true, of a screwball true. comedy. You have hijinks that are derived from disguises and misunderstandings and secrets that are being kept and trying to, you know, the colloquial two dates at prom thing of like, I'm trying to help hold a truth with these Mm -hmm. two people who cannot know the other one doesn't know the other thing. Ironically, actually, and this is tying, we're going back into your point. I think some of the elements that they could have expanded on could have turned this into a screwball comedy. This story could be told as a screwball comedy and link later sidesteps both that tone and the story beats that you would take to do that you would have had more of him like you were saying interacting with people while he's with the girlfriend um a lot of other larger set pieces that are built exclusively around making him feel anxious and embarrassed which the movie's not particularly interested in i think i mean you know, there's not a lot of slapstick in this movie. We could go down the list of things mm-hmm. that check mark as a screwball comedy. But I think the ultimate one is that the screwball comedy, and I believe where the term actually originates in, is the like kind of emasculation of the male lead and the alpha maleization of the female lead, which while kind of is present in the story, is not played that way dynamically. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a very definitive switch in that uh, before the leads even meet. I would say I think there's there's plenty of space for that to have maybe grown, but they didn't go that route, which I think is fine. I don't think yeah, we need to pigeonhole this into the idea of a screwball comedy, even though. The idea of a Glenn Powell-led screwball comedy sounds pretty awesome. This just isn't oh, necessarily yeah. what that is. They should make that movie. Somebody with this exact with these actors. Somebody should yeah, make yeah, honest, that movie. Honestly, a remake of What's Up, Doc? Starring Glenn. I mean, Glenn, that would be pretty good. That kind of great, right? Does he have a nerd voice locked in? Does he have like a little like? Well, whiny... didn't we hear it in this movie? I guess I he kind of like, does. Yeah, Gary has a little bit more. Like Ron is. He's dope. He's got the cool voice. He's like, he's speaking as Ron, you know, but Gary definitively is like, oh, I like cats. I'm, oh, you want me to go do the thing? Sure. And then he melts into like, I toss a finger out every five months. Like it's, yeah, it's very definitive. I, I like, I like it a lot. So this is also kind of a mulligan for me, not bringing up the fall guy being a screwball comedy when we covered it. So this is kind of like a, a an also post war acknowledgement good. <laughs> of that. Good, good, good. There, there, there needs to be some acknowledgement of that. Cause again, what I'm lacking in screwball comedy and in more of a thriller vibe is both found in fall guy. And in this, I, my, my problem lies with, they set up uh, an internal conflict and an external conflict. And, 
well, I wanted to see an expansion of, oh, maybe the the dirty cop. Oh, he's got the upper hand. Oh, but maybe does he have the upper hand? Because because mm-hmm. Gary is like, oh, weren't you there? And I know information about you. And then it's it's resolved without it, it growing into something more than that. The same way that the entire time I was waiting for Madison to betray Ron and well, say, oh, you handled my gun and I used that gun to kill my husband and I know you're a contract killer. Maybe I'm a femme fatale style red herring. But I think it, it, that is absolutely intentional. I think that that from the midpoint on the movie is training you to be ready for her betrayal. I think that is absolutely 100 percent intentional. And as as much as it sucks to say that I would like to fall into a little bit of formula, I think that would have had a little bit harder of an ending than what we got, which is a nice, sweet little look at their life together after they face no consequences for their double murder. And then, then they <sighs> just get to make a quip about the pie. And it seems like there could have been a little... Again, it's the, it's the lack of edge and where Gary slash Ron goes up to that edge. I don't think he goes far enough up to the edge he, he's a little too safe as a character the whole time for me to think that there was going to be more e- even the madison being a femme fatale idea that i had the whole time seemed like at a certain point like well is that gonna happen i would feel bad for gary and slash ron because he's not done a single bad thing the whole time arguably including the tying a bag around uh homeboy's head at the mm-hmm. end i do admit that a scene that I felt was missing is them getting rid of the body. I think that Hmm. they needed a scene where I was waiting for this to get a little bit darker once I realized what it was. As it stands now, they have, like, because they signed the contract, right? Like, that's the cute little innuendo that they do multiple times throughout the movie. Of course, yeah. And as he lies dying on the floor, they, quote-unquote, they sign their contract, and that's, you know... In the narrative arc, that is the ultimate commitment. That's that's essentially their marriage, right? I think it would have been more effective for me to see them. They don't only, you know, they don't only kill this guy together, but then they have to disposing of a body is such a big talking point throughout the film that we never get to see uh, anyone do. Mm. Not, I shouldn't say get to like it's a treat, but <laughs> but you know. like they, there's such a colorful way that they describe this all the different characters that he gets to embody they're you know they're not going to chop off one finger they're not going to toss one finger out of a window at the end they're not going to go to the swamp where the gators are at all that's what i thought the end was going to be when we got to oh they're killing this guy together i'm like okay so the last shot of the movie is glenn powell making a gross face when he's dropping fingers (laughs) out a window but then kissing his new bride slash you know, Bonnie exactly. and Clyde style yes. woman and being like, this is for this is for a good life. But also having that scene would have underlined a little bit more the themes that the movie is already chasing, right? That there's a lot of societal commentary, of course, of, you know, it, t- it talks about cops a lot in the in the kind of neutered nature mm. of the effectiveness of police work and that there is no inherent compassion to it, but there's, it's also for as mean spirited and belligerent as it is not very effective at executing actual justice or protection, etc. The things that we have, like the way that society neglects us that we then have to compensate for in order to have a quote unquote normal life or a, a life that we desire that's all absolutely there, and I think that putting the emphasis on the hardship that they go through at the end by including more work, because she even kills mm-hmm. him fairly easily. It's not like she even has to pull a gun on him, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. he, as soon as he knows it, he's dead, and sure, Gary has to seal the deal with the, with the grocery bag, but that element could have... I will give you that. I think that element could have been more strongly emphasized especially because it's a very good marriage of the themes of what's going on inside gary and what's going on in the world um and the actions that he's forced to take link later is always 
talking in his films about the way we perform in different social settings and the importance of figuring out the authenticity of who you are in that ever-changing artifice, which is totally something that's going on with Gary slash Ron. For sure, yeah. But, but in Hitman, that doesn't resolve as neatly as it usually does in a Linklater movie, that it's much more focused on action and how acting the way you want to be informs who you become. Like, act as if ye have faith and faith will be given to you. Mm. So... I don't think it squares as neatly as something like a Dazed and Confused where it's like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't have a football player, but I have my friends and you can't call my friends <laughs> losers or whatever, you know, because in a way, all of his films are about seeing through artifice and finding yourself through authenticity. This film, I do think that it's a little bit stickier and I know that this is something you're looking for. So now I... I'm not talking myself down to agreeing with you. I am talking myself a little bit into... <laughs> You're falling right into my trap, Dr. Movies. I am talking myself movies. into a little bit <laughs> where it's a text where you really do have to, to work to meet those themes and to marry the two sides of the internal and external conflicts the way that we have just been discussing. And we don't see Gary struggle as much as we do see him transform. Mm-hmm. And I guess that that is where, as as annoying as I said it would be, something like losing Madison more concretely for a period of time might have raised those stakes a little bit. But also, I don't think they raised stakes for us in a meaningful way. So I don't really wish that was in the movie. It's just an example of a way that we could have seen him struggle a little bit more. Or if... There was a negative consequence. This is honestly, this is the classroom scene I'm I'm missing. Is <laughs> if there were a negative consequence in his personal life to him exactly. becoming yes, Ron. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a totally fair criticism, Shannon. You yeah, you have sold me on that. I've sold there, myself on that. I guess <laughs> you have sold yourself for me, which is just like you playing chess against yourself and me reaping the benefits. I suppose <laughs> that's what I call the I, pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> accurate very accurate i uh that that's what it really comes down to me for as well there are three worlds that he lives in it's with madison at the police department and in teaching and i just don't think any of the consequences of his ron slash however many other personality decisions that he makes creeps into any one of them enough to show those consequences before he ultimately is pretty much fine in any given one. He he becomes a better teacher. He becomes really well respected in his undercover job and he gets away with murder and gets the girl without having to really come to terms with her be- being a murderer or him being a murderer. They just kind of mutually agree to walk past it a little bit more than a, a pure Gary versus a, a Ron influenced Gary might do. Okay, you breaking it down that way, I now have something to counterbalance with. Please, please. That there is an equilibrium in the classroom setting. And that the film is is kind of posturing that setting as where the, the real Gary Ron is. That he is thought of as this, this clandestine nerd in the police setting where there are more dire consequences for him. Like just because it doesn't blow back on his teaching job doesn't mean that, I mean, there are very definite suspicions and and conversations and, and jeopardies in his job with the police. And Mm. then obviously you have when he's with Madison as Ron, when he's living that life of, of male empowerment, those two things are, found together in like so i guess link later's trying to say that that's where he truly gets to be himself and maybe it would undermine that idea to have more plot driven consequence invade that story space Mm. i'm not saying it invalidates my complaint from a minute ago but you are giving me a new avenue with which to think about that three life structure 
Well, I, again, I, I want to reiterate that I did ultimately enjoy this more than maybe any other Netflix original besides Glass Onion, I want to say. I don't You've not seen often, enough Netflix uh, originals, Seamus. I, I've seen a good amount of Netflix originals, Garrett. I don't know. I, uh... As far as I can tell, what have I what have I not seen that I should that might change my mind a little bit? Because at this point, I feel like, well, Hitman is better than the average Netflix original offering that I that I intake. It, it is you know it, it leaves me wanting a little bit. Uh, to Five Bloods is the first one that comes to me, which I know That's you have not seen. A Netflix original, huh? That is a Netflix original. Yeah, so I can see you thinking there, Shavis, that. Oh, maybe I've maybe I've misjudged um, <laughs> what maybe constitutes I mean, hey, I'm a, a, I'm a c- Netflix original. <laughs> I'm a Klaus guy. I bring up Klaus around the holidays. Yeah, oh my you know? goodness, Klaus I, uh... is way better than than <laughs> this the, movie exactly. or Glass Onion. How about that? Well, sure. Okay, fair enough. The, all hail Klaus. I agree. Yeah. Okay, we don't need to go down the Netflix rabbit hole any more than that. We'll save that for the next battle of streaming services. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness, and we will. But I agree with you. This is like for an for an Netflix original. This is a very good movie. Yes. It's a real movie, dare I say? Yeah, it feels more. It, that is another thing I will also afford this movie is that it feels more like a real movie than a reg, than an average Netflix anything. It makes me want to maybe maybe watch that other Glenn Powell rom com that came out a couple months ago. I anyone I'm but unsure. you. Anyone but you. Actually, yes. okay. Speaking of Netflix movies and Glenn Powell rom coms, don't watch anyone but you. I which oh. I saw. Watch Set It Up, which is a rom com with up. Glenn Powell and Zoe Deutsch, aka Leah Thompson's daughter, who you oh. know from things. She's been in things. Um, which episode of Frasier was she in? No, she's too that. young. She's the, the, she's which which episode of the Frasier revival there was you she go. in? She was in Zombieland 2, Double Tap, a movie Damn. I did not see. <laughs> Neither did I. Damn it. She's good. Anyway, you would like her. And then she and Glenn Powell are in this rom-com where they play assistants to Lucy Liu and Tay Diggs. And are trying to set up Lucy Liu and Tay Diggs, but also, oh. of course, are having their own chemistry. Netflix that original. Sounds... It's charming. It's what fun. The hell? You should watch that. That's how I don't think very anyone much to do. Uh, honestly, I just don't I mean... think it's very good. Yes, set it up is a much better version of of a similar idea and tone that closes the book on that. We were talking about this being a real movie. Oh, I have a few other things to say about that. Yes, please. Link later has been on the press tour for this going studios don't want to make movies for adults anymore. I want to make movies for adults. I want movies with adult stakes, with sex, with swearing, with, with complex situations and good for him for having that attitude, especially when I don't think any of his films are out of accessibility. I don't think he makes like, super art films but if you look at his work like the before trilogy or even to a certain extent something like dazed and confused which is probably his most famous work there is a more art house sensibility to those films Mm. a lack of of formality and when he's coming into this reads like a 90s studio comedy more than it does a Richard Linklater movie to me. So I just appreciate that he's out there doing the good work as well, which is maybe another reason I am willing to give it more leeway than you are, because I am the one who complains more on the show (laughs) about those things than you do. Because I don't want movies to just stop doing newer, different things that I'm maybe not as accustomed to. I, I don't want it to be as and formulaic it's, it's as it It's valid for it to take risks that don't agree with you. I think I don't want to... I agree. I no, don't want I you agree. to come away thinking that I was implying anything other than that. I, I agree. I, I, I often enjoy when we don't see completely eye to eye on That's things fine. like this, especially during Glenn Powell's summer, for God's sake. This Ugh. isn't Glenn Powell court. So, We're not going in there yet. <laughs> when I hate Twisters and you think it's the best movie of the year, <laughs> even better than Furio, so we'll return to this conversation. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right, let me rewatch Maverick first, and then we'll, then we'll re- maybe be go. more on level playing field. Okay. So, should we move on to our pop culture references? Is there anything else you need about, uh, no, I, about Glenn I, Powell here? I think 
I think we're. I think that does it. Let, let's let's get into a little more Wallace and Gromit, why don't we? For today's pop culture reference, we're going to be talking about the history of Wallace and Gromit. Beloved characters Wallace and Gromit are perhaps the most recognizable stop-motion figures in pop culture. With a massive media empire spanning short and feature films, series, video games, comics, and even a theme park ride. However, Wallace and Gromit began their existence in 1982 as the humble stars of A Grand Day Out, Nick Park's graduation project at the National Film and Television School. While in production on A Grand Day Out, Park began working at Ardman Animations, who allowed him to continue his work on the short. To voice the zany inventor Wallace, Park solicited English television actor Peter Salas, paying him 50 pounds for the role. Nearly a decade after Park began production, A Grand Day Out released to massive acclaim, earning nominations for Best Animated Short at the BAFTAs and Academy Awards. The duo rose to further fame as short films The Wrong Trousers and A Close Shave released in 1993 and 1995 respectively, with both shorts winning Best Animated Short, Academy Awards, and making Wallace and Gromit internationally celebrated characters. However, after this time, Wallace and Gromit largely went dormant aside from appearances in video games and a 2002 TV miniseries of two-minute shorts, Wallace and Gromit's Cracking Contraptions. Ardman shifted its focus to other projects, mostly the newly inked five-picture deal with DreamWorks, beginning with Ardman's first feature, Chicken Run. In 2005, it was not only time for the pair of inventors to return from a decade-long absence, but to make their big-screen debut in Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Winning the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, Were-Rabbit reinvigorated interest in the Wallace and Gromit brand, spurring a comic series and a video game tie-in. After the underperformance of Ardman's first computer animated feature, Flushed Away, Ardman and DreamWorks dissolved their partnership, with Park citing DreamWorks' direction for Wallace and Gromit as a contributing factor. Another blow was dealt when a warehouse fire destroyed nearly all of Ardman's sets, props, and models from past projects in 2005, just months after the release of Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Free of their DreamWorks obligation, Ardman refocused on Wallace and Gromit. Park began work on a new short, A Matter of Loaf and Death, as well as a TV series spin-off focusing on Shaun the Sheep, a character from A Close Shave. Shaun the Sheep grew so popular, in fact, that he became Ardman's primary franchise going forward. Between Shaun and a new three-film deal with Sony Pictures, Wallace and Gromit seemed to once again be on the back burner. Save for an adaptation from acclaimed video game developer Telltale, an edutainment BBC miniseries, and a themed dark ride at England's Pleasure Beach Resort. In 2019, Peter Salas passed away at the age of 96. Though Park and Ardman both expressed that losing Wallace's original voice would not necessarily rule out the duo's eventual return to the screen. This week's news confirmed just that, with the announcement of a new Wallace and Gromit feature film, Vengeance Most Foul. Ben Whitehead will be assuming the voice of Wallace, having previously filled in for the Telltale game and some more recent VR titles. Wallace and Gromit, I think you and I talked a little bit previously on the show, if, you know, a billion years ago when Peter Salas died. Um, mm, yeah. About how Wallace and Gromit is a decided childhood favorite that, as I alluded to earlier, I don't think has ever really let me down. It's always quality. I know that whenever I'm going into a new Wallace and Gromit shorter feature that it's going to be a well-told, fun story with characters I really enjoy, and I hope that they are able to keep that up with Vengeance Most Foul. Yeah, me me too. I remember Were-Rabbit being kind of a... I, I guess I, I had lower expectations considering how amazing the shorts are, but I remember loving Were-Rabbit when it came out, to be honest. And I, I know we both recently dabbled very briefly in the Telltale games and kind of, you know, enjoyed the expanded universe, as it were. I am uh, I'm I'm very excited for this new one and I I would think it would be pretty fun to check out those comics too. I I am very unversed in the comics, but I think that would be a really interesting way to consume Wallace and Gromit stories. 
I don't really want to go to the Irish coast just to do this. I want to go ride that theme park. Oh, it, dude, I that would be so much fun. If there's anything that warrants a theme park ride with how mechanical and like Rube Goldberg machine everything is in Wallace and Gromit, I feel like that's a no-brainer for sure. But why don't we save the rec center with our Save the Rec Center Omatic, Seamus? Oh, yes, please and thank you. I won't forget the crackers. <laughs> Now it's time to save the rec center, where we give you our weekly recommendations. What do you got for me this week, Garrett? Seamus, I do not think it's going to come as a surprise to you, because I've already been briefly singing its praises, and I gracefully, tactfully avoided bringing it up during the main segment, if not to spoil for the audience, that my rec center this week is going to be Richard Linklater's Everybody Wants Some. Ah, uh, yes, okay. Also starring Hitman star Glenn Powell, along with Zoe Deutsch from Set It oh, Up, hey, the movie that I brought that. up earlier. Okay. Another Hitman cast member, Austin Amelio, and favorite here on the Pop Culture Reference podcast, Wyatt Russell. Ooh, yes. A spiritual sequel to Dazed and Confused in that it is a big ensemble hangout movie set in a similar time frame. Now this time where the kids who were graduating or in high school in Dazed and Confused would be coming to college. And... It's not the same characters or anything, but it's a lot of the same tone. Though for me, it works a whole lot. I like Days and Confused, but Everybody Wants Some is just an immaculate vibe. Some of the best bro cinema that we've ever discussed on this show. I mean, I put it up there with Lord of the Rings and Hudson Hawk and Furious Whoa, 7. All right, as, all right. Hey, hey, hey. That's some, that's some strong words, my friend. The chemistry between these fellas, Seamus, you, it's like if hanging out with the guys were bottled for cinema. Mm. And, I mean, not that everybody's great, not that, you lo- not that you like everybody, but it does have, whereas... Days and Confused is often referred to as an anti-nostalgia film. This is absolutely a nostalgia film. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, isn't it just nice when you're just with your buddies and trying to entertain each other and one-up each other and make whatever you can a game? Um, I have I've known about it since it came out and have been kind of vaguely interested. Uh, it's not until recently that I really got that interested in Linklater as a filmmaker, but... Let me tell you, Everybody Wants Some is definitively my favorite of his films that I have seen, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. That is a great endorsement, man. I remember when this was coming out, and it actually got me to watch Dazed and Confused for the first time in high school, and I thoroughly enjoyed Dazed and Confused, and then just straight up never went to see Everybody Wants Some. So I I remember being really charmed by the trailers and the promo stuff that I, I saw, and Obviously, that was in, like, the early days of Wyatt Russell, and I was like, this kid's got something. I should keep my eye on him. <laughs> I, I wonder and... why you thought that. <laughs> yeah, dude, who, who could have who known? Not not me at the time. No, sir. But uh, I, I never got around to it, but I, I feel like, you know, it's summertime. I just got my Jaws 4K. I'm, I'm really in the summertime movie mood, and I feel like that's one of them to, to add to the list for sure. I, I think it's a pretty perfect... Uh summertime movie so i'm very excited to get your feedback and i only wish that one of us had seen it sooner so that we would have known about (laughs) one powell sooner i think oh if only that's the big takeaway but what do you have this week seamus in honor of our last week's episode i revisited a child i won't say a childhood favorite because i distinctly remember not really clicking with it at the time but I really click now with Matthew Broderick's Dabney Coleman's War Games that I sought out very, very specifically. It is a phenomenal film, Garrett. I don't know when the last time you watched that is, and I know I brought up Cloak and Dagger a lot last time with Dabney Coleman's passing, and we were we were reminiscing about about his work, but War Games is 
phenomenal. I don't know what age you're really supposed to view that for the first time, but I was far too young. I have a vivid memory of the the credits start rolling at the end of War Games and my little kid self being like, well, nothing happened. You know, uh-huh. like that there was no con- like there was no conflict going on, like really. And watching it this past week just kind of reminded of Davity Coleman's great work and and vague nostalgia about it. It blew me out of the water. I thought it was phenomenal, really well acted for, you know, a very, very early or maybe the first Matthew Broderick role. I believe some something around there, but I I was really taken with it. I thought it was honest to God thrilling for you know if you were to ask me fifteen years ago how little quote unquote happens in this movie, I thought it was phenomenal, and I will recommend that with or without the recent passing of dear beloved Dabney Coleman. I think it's just incredible, start to finish, and. I am definitely going to rewatch Cloak and Dagger if I can get my hands on it. And weirdly enough, Tron. I'm I'm on a, a kick of movies that I didn't appreciate enough as a kid, I think. And just because of how much I really, really connected with War Games this last time around. I've not seen that since I was a kid. And though I remember really enjoying it, I think it's definitely due for a rewatch. And I totally understand what you're saying about the in a child's conception anti-climax that that could be better appreciated Mm. as an adult also seems like a very good summertime movie so we're trading like nice summertime racks (laughs) yes i will say when you were building up before you said the title a massive pit for it in my stomach because i really believe that you're going to say matthew broderick's dabney coleman's inspector gadget and i was like oh my god no no I haven't quite revisited that one yet. It's on the list now that you've reminded me, but I I went for the I struck gold instantly. I didn't want to I didn't want to build up to it. I went straight to the good stuff. Good. I'm glad. One of the one of the great tangents in pop culture reference history was about Inspector Gadget. That's <laughs> like tripled the length of a news segment in our early days. Uh, just as any good podcast is wont to do. As Inspector Gadget course. really throws a wrench into it. <laughs> uh, go, go, Gadget wrench, if you will. Go, go, that Gadget, Dabney Coleman. But I think that wraps us up for this week's show. If you want to reach us on social media, you can find us on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram at PCR underscore podcast. Email us at popculturereferencepod at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube. Any kind of engagement you can give us really helps the show out. Next week, what you gonna do? (laughs) (laughs) What you gonna do when PCR comes for you is the real question. We are both wearing black tank tops, black sunglasses, and and running down an airstrip for Bad Boys <laughs> 1 and 2, pre-reboot uh, Bad Boys in honor of Bad Boys Ride or Die coming out. So, uh, I'm sure those will be very interesting conversations. Very interesting conversations. Peak yeah. Bayhem. I don't know the last time we talked Michael Bay on this show, if ever, so that will be interesting in and of itself. <laughs> Yes, I know we have different histories with the OG Bad Boys films? Question mark is what it, well, you know, whatever. We'll get it. We'll talk. We'll if talk. There's, if there's any, if there's any truly valid candidate for vulgar auteurism, it's Michael Bay. It's, Absolutely. It, well, well, that is going to be the deep cinema kino conversation we have next week for sure. I'm looking forward to it, Seamus. Adios, Glenn Powell.